yeah, I'm happy to, to kick us off. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me and see me good? Perfect. Uh, my name is Bria. My pronouns are they and she. Um, so glad to be here with y'all this evening. Um, some of the identities that I hold very close is that I am a Black, queer, uh, non-binary, and intersex person. I, I also work uh, with Interact Advocates for Intersex Youth, and I am a cat parent to Milo, who will likely make a guest appearance here at some point. Glad to be here. I'll go next. Um, my name is uh, Sean Cypher Wall. I'm co-founder of the Intersex Justice Project, um, as well as uh, uh, Marie Curie Fellow uh, with the INEA cohort, which stands for Intersex New Inter Interdisciplinary Approaches. I live in Manchester, England, where it's currently five hours ahead of the East Coast. Um, and everyone's preparing for Guy Fox uh, night, which is a lot of fireworks and stuff like that. And so it's a little, a little nutty right now. So if you hear my dog, Barking, that's why. So yeah, that's me. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Casey Orozco Poor. Um, I am a fifth year student at Harvard Medical School, um, hoping to become a child neurologist. Um, I have been working with all these lovely people for a few years, and I'm really looking forward to talking about how to mobilize intersex led care um, principles um, in um, inside of medical curriculum and outside with direct action and such. Um, so thank you so much for joining. And hi, everybody. I'm Hans. I'm the former communications director over at Interact. And in general, I am an artist and an educator who does work in the media, consulting on intersex issues, and also educating medical students. Can we get a next slide? Thank you, Coco and Brianna, um, who are helping us out with the Zoom admin. Uh, so welcome, everybody. We'd love to also um, have some participation, have folks report back in chat. Um, tell us where you're coming from, you know, name, pronouns, school institution, city, um, maybe something tasty you've eaten recently, if you feel like it. Um, that's always good. I'm really grooving on this tofu salad that I just made. We see some familiar faces, too. I think I saw Justin and Alicia from U of I. Hi, everybody. Um, so I invite everybody to keep those rolling in. We'd love to um, hear from folks and where you're coming from. Can we get a next slide? Ooh, ooh peanut brittle. Um, all right, so in this session, um, we want to respect your time and try to keep it tight. So as we mentioned, we're going to be covering some language, tips for how to be affirming to intersex patients and their families when you encounter them in your practice, how to identify points of impact for um, organizing within your school or hospital, connecting with others, all the folks that are here, as well as some actionable resources for intersex patient care and policy change, because those resources exist. There are many awesome guides and websites and stuff that already exist. So we're here to kind of um, point everybody in the right direction. Ooh, Trader Joe's scallion pain. Okay, all right. The chat is great. Um, can I get a next slide? All right, so we, um, like I said, really would love to know um, who all is here, where folks are coming from. So Coco just dropped a link in the chat that is a super quick um, one to two minute survey. Um, we would love to know who's all here, um, what your medical specialties are, if your um, you know, M1s, M2s have started thinking about that yet. And it also gives us the opportunity, um, if you would like, um, optional, no pressure, to give us your email address and opt in for um, being connected either both with each other or future opportunities for advocacy and med school, um, just different opportunities in the future. So that link, um, let's see, Kevin said in the chat, is it for students only? Um, that is a great question. I was just about to say, I'd love everyone to sign up and just put if you're a student or not, perhaps. Um, I think international collaborations are super exciting. I know there's some folks that are here that aren't necessarily med students, um, but I think, yeah, I would love to know just everyone's info. 
and make sure to put a non-edu email um <laughs> we want to make sure that we want to you know because those edus sometimes can bounce back so please put a gmail please 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 or another email yeah, and I would love um, for us to have more opportunities to connect in the future, either people from the same institutions or different institutions talking with each other. So um, this gives us the opportunity to do that, you know, at the beginning while we have everybody here, and then we can figure that out. So I set the timer for about a minute. Um, we'll leave that up as folks trickle in, um, continue to share in the chat and fill out those surveys, let us know um, where you're coming from, what your interests are. Um, and we'll try to be responsive to that throughout the presentation as well, because it's whatever is useful to folks. I see Sam in the chat. Hello. Is there a way to sort of pin the um, survey in the chat, the survey link? That is a great question. Maybe. Um, maybe i think at least you can paste it in a couple of times maybe like coco could paste it in um after some more folks have finished sharing in the chat and we can um get rolling because i know we started a few minutes late um let's see next slide saifa okay great um so i've been working in collaboration like this has been spearheaded by the wonderful students at um, Columbia who are um, protesting, turning up. Um, so um, Sam, do you just wanna give just a couple seconds about um, what y'all are doing and how people can join? Yeah, sure, thank you. And appreciate um, being in the space with y'all. Uh, yeah, so, um, over a couple of years, uh, Columbia Students for Intersex Justice was created after connecting with SIFA and Intersex Justice Project, with, um, which SIFA is a part of. Um, and over the past couple of years have just been trying to work within Columbia and outside of Columbia um, to advocate for intersex justice in all its forms. Um, and part of that is protesting for um, intersex justice and um, accountability for the harm that's occurred at Columbia and Cornell, because it's all part of the system of New York Presbyterian, um, as well as protesting for reparations um, and for the end of intersex surgeries, which I imagine we'll talk a bit about today. Um, so would love for y'all to join us in an art build as well as the actual protests which are listed here. Amazing, amazing. So um, please watch out. Um, information is going to be going about that, going out about that over social media. Um, next slide, please. All right, let's center, let's center. Um, so, you know, this is a consent based practice um, just to sort of like get us into the space because if we're going to be talking about bodies, let us try to be in our bodies, right? Or let's try to be present with them as much as possible. Um, so I'm gonna ask everyone if we can just um, kind of stop for a minute. Um, I know that people are coming to this after work, um, maybe after a day of classes, you know, and just a reminder that we center for the purpose of getting connected to ourselves, to the land, um, to ancestry and legacy. So I'm going to ask for everyone, wherever you are, whether you're seating, whether you're seated or standing, if you can just stop, turn the phone over, put it on silent, um, just to really sort of just ground yourself in the space. Um, and sort of do a scan from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. So if people want to get connected to the center, it's about an inch or two below the belly button. And Sam, I'm going to ask if you can do me a favor and take the, um, take the screen off for a minute, just for a sec while we center, if it's possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, 
So we center in three directions. Uh, we center in our length, which we associate with dignity. We center in our width, which we associate with expansiveness, expansiveness and boundaries. And we center in our depth, which we associate with ancestry and legacy. So we're gonna start by centering in our length, uh, which is our dignity. So like actually feel as much as you can, try to feel your feet on the ground. And imagine that you are a tree and that tree can be rooted anywhere. It can be in your backyard. It can be in the most beautiful place that you visited. So allow yourself to be that tree where your feet are the roots of the tree, your body is the trunk of the tree, and your head is the canopy. What becomes possible when we reclaim our dignity? How can you connect deeper to your longings and your desire? How can you really allow yourself as much as you can take up more space in this plane? So from center, we're going to center in our width, which we associate with expansiveness and boundaries. So allow yourself to really locate and feel the space between your feet your legs, your hips, your shoulders, and your ears. You know, as queer folks, as trans folks, non-binary folks, people who, have, who may occupy multiple identities, multiple spaces, we have had people encroach on our boundaries. We, have, we have, might have crossed other people's boundaries. We might have had to fight for our space, for the right to take up more space. So as much as you can, try to occupy more space in your body. And if you can't, just notice. This is about noticing. We're not in a race. Just notice what you can feel and what you can't feel. Get curious. And from center, I'm gonna ask us to center in our depth, which we associate with ancestry and with legacy. Imagine this plane that is beautiful, almost like the galaxy, this ancestral plane that goes in many directions, frontward, backward, to the side, in many directions. We will all one day join that plane. But for now, I'm gonna ask us to center in our depth and feel our back, locate our ancestors at our back. Some of us have really complicated relationships with our ancestors. Some ancestors have harmed us. Some ancestors we love and we miss. Some of us may not know our ancestors and may connect to another ancestor. We may be moved by spirit guides. So whoever represents ancestry for you, allow them to have their hands at your back, to feel the presence of a force, of a spirit that is greater than you that is loving you, that is comforting. And as we move toward our legacy with a heart that never stops beating, lungs that expand and contract, taking in air, a stomach that churns food and information for the nourishment of our bodies, let us be reminded that we all will die. Some of us have already lost loved ones. So in feeling into your own death, your own legacy, connect really deeply to what you care about. Connect to what you organize your life around, your passion, your desire, 
and let that fill you up. And I'm gonna ask everyone to take a really deep collective breath into that center. And if it helps to let your jaw go, to smooth out your brows, to bring some feeling to your hands, to your feet, to notice the sensations, whatever came up for you during the centering exercise. And to use the chat to sort of just sound out, to feel out some of whatever came up for you in the centering practice. Because intersex justice is heart work and let us be connected to our heart, our souls and our spirits, even in institutions that are inherently violent. So let us be connected to what we care about and what we long for. All right, so please, 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 you know, folks, use the chat, share what uh, has come up for you during the centering practice, and let's begin. Sam, can you provide me with some slides, please? All right, all right, Casey, you're on, friend. Okay, everyone. So we want this to be interactive and we just want to get a sense of what folks know. Um, so especially the Columbia and Mount Sinai and New York City um, uh, students joining us who like might be in the same room together. Maybe if you could open this up on your phone, um, just so we can get a lot of like discussion going among the med students who are joining in. Um, so if you could, all right, so the link is not clickable. Um, could you copy and paste this, Sam? I could also, I could also go get it. Let me go retrieve it. Um, but we would like to ask you, what do you know so far about intersex topics and have you seen anything so far in your school's curriculum? <clears throat> okay, let me know if that link works. Um, unfortunately- oh, Oh, sorry, just um, Casey, if folks are in a room together and like don't have different devices to click on here also is a short link. Um, if people are just like typing it in on the phone, bit.ly slash intermural. Hans always does this. It's like always like the most useful thing. It's not possible. a secret. You just go to bit.ly and then type in your know. stuff and it's short and it's beautiful. There's a Hans lot is amazing. Things. Yeah, there's a lot. There's like a few other things. <laughs> and I was also hoping this would be anonymous, but you know, we're we're troubleshooting. So um, yeah, just please feel free to write, even if you might not know stuff about intersex issues, you know, um, and like intersex folks and, and in a medical context, I think it's really important to be honest about um what we do and don't know in medicine um, and to approach that with humility. Um, so I really encourage folks to be honest if, if they don't know things or if they have questions, we really like are, are very open to like earnest sincere questions about this because there is such limited education and such concerted efforts to prevent that education from actually happening in all of your classrooms. Um, so we just really want to invite a brave space in the sticky notes. All right, also, if you want to add another sticky note, there's like a, they're like the third, uh, the fourth button down is a little sticky note one. So if you want to get your own, I'll make one. Boom, another orange one. <laughs> wow, this is fun. I like just making them. <laughs> Excellent. Huge fan of the colors. Big plus. I know. I think it makes it so much more personable. All right. Um, so yeah, we're just going to wrap this up quickly. Um, but I see that people are already leaving some amazing comments. We have 0%. Thank you so much for um, including that um, at Toro. Yeah, that's 
that's good to know. Uh, recently added a few slides for anatomy at Columbia, but otherwise lacking. And that's in the context of like a lot of effort with the with the Columbia um, student group for intersex justice, I believe, Sam, correct me if I said that wrong, um, who has been working with SIFA for just so many years, um, so so earnestly um, with, with community and scientific backing um, to like get those, get those few slides in. Um, so yeah, it's not for lack of trying, certainly not included at Fordham. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're knowing about mul some, some multiple intersex identities at Columbia. So, you know, some recognition that intersex people exist. Still got a bare minimum, but I'm glad they're making the curriculum. Nothing, um, nothing at UMass Med Nursing. Yeah, and so I think, um, you know, folks maybe can keep, um, how do we feel on time? I'm okay with wrapping this up because I feel like everyone has such interesting things to say for the rest of the chat. I think if folks want to keep filling this out, maybe we could revisit it like later, um, right before the breakout room to so just kind of see where folks landed on things. Um, but I'm just going to keep it moving. Um, but thank you so much for that info. Yes, it's not much of anything in medical schools. Little intersex history. So basically, I, I think uh, Lizzie Rice uh, or Lizzie Reese um, may be on this call. So I feel a little nervous because she's a historian. And when I'm in the presence of other historians, I'm just like, whoa, this is official. Um, so intersex history is like really long and broad and deep. Um, we're talking about hundreds of years. Um, but I'm trying to sort of condense it and sort of tease out the finer parts because I think in order for us to really understand what we're looking at, this, you know, history always tells us the story of how we got here, right? Um, and so I think, think it's really important to sort of put it into context. So if we can do next slide, please. So basically this is my opening statement, right? Like, um, you know, medical institutions were built on bio, um, built in in violence. You know, um, especially Western medicine, and I think it's just really important for us to really understand that um, medicine was also a part of the colonial project. Um, it's deeply entrenched in racism, transphobia, interphobia, um, and interphobia is like you know similar to homophobia, not similar to homophobia, but it's a you know fear of intersex bodies. Um, xenophobia and colonization. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, basically, you know, one of the books, and I got this book from uh, Napantla, who's also on this call, um, Sex in the Body. Um, so Ann Falso Sterling um, sort of created this, um, this, this idea of like the five sexes, right? And this, you know, we're, human beings are like flowers. It's more than just, you know, we're so diverse in our, you know, sex characteristics. But basically, you know, Anne Falso Sterling wrote the book in 2000 called Sex in the Body and she recently updated the edition. So basically um, it's really good to go back into this history to sort of see that, you know, intersex people at one point um, and mind you, this is in a Western context because intersex people were definitely recognized in other parts of the world outside of the Western world. Um, but when it came to sort of like white, white, white man's laws, um, intersex people were recognized. Um, and I think it often became an issue of the courts when it had to be sort of decided um, the sort of gender of that intersex person. Um, next slide. So um, Sir Edward Koch, um, he was a statesman and a lawyer, and he sort of sort of codified um, law in England. Um, it's funny, um, sort of he had wrote this statement um, to say that when it came to inheritance and property, that every heir is either male, female, or hermaphrodite. Um, and toward the end, he says, you know, that for the sort of intersex person is whatever the sex that doth prevail, right? It's funny because years later, John Money would write 
um, an article with that same title, The Sex That Doth Prevail. So even when um, intersex people were acknowledged, they always had to choose a gender, which was, you know, again, coming back to this gender binary. Next slide. Okay, so I'm in, in talking about the history of medicine, some of these slides, I just wanna give a trigger warning, are gonna be a little bit graphic. Um, and I think it's really um, to sort of show that the gender binary is violent, right? Um, is, is violent to people who are cis, it's violent to people who are trans and intersex. Um, so this is just a cursory sort of, you know, little points in history. Um, but essentially, you know, because intersex people could choose their gender, you often had people, um, some mostly um, people who were assigned female at birth, who probably had different intersex variations, who wanted to be able to choose their gender, were like, okay, you know, I, I feel that I'm a hermaphrodite. I'm gonna, I'm living, I'm in this sort of same sex relationship. I wanna go to the court so that I can choose to sort of live as a man so that my relationship can be legitimized. Um, but what was interesting um, is that often what would happen is that this decision would be arbitrary by, you know, by a doctor. Doctors were always brought in. There was no consensus on what constituted um, an intersex body. And as a result, if this woman, in this case, would petition a court and she was found not to be herma a hermaphrodite, this is, you know, people can read what would happen. Um, so it was really sort of like really barbaric um, in some ways. And again, sort of like reinforcing this gender binary. Next slide, please. So, you know, I think there was a sort of turning point and the turning point was in the 19th century on both sides of the Atlantic, Britain and France and in the United States. So prior to the sort of the advent of gynecology, mostly women saw other women's genitals. Um, but then in gynecology, when gynecology was started, it was mostly a male profession, interestingly enough. Um, then men started to notice the variation in women's genitals, which also created a lot of these theories around hysteria, around like, you know, if a woman had a larger than size clitoris, she would be a lesbian or she would be in any sort of like, you know, theories that men had about um, a woman's genitals. Um, and a lot of women felt uncomfortable with a man seeing their genitals, right? Especially if they weren't married to this man. But then this created a crisis um, with gender. And so they had to be like, well, then it sort of became the categories, right? That um, they moved from like sex variations and genital variations to sort of like there's male, there's female and hermaphrodite. And the hermaphrodite, in order to be a hermaphrodite, you would, to be a true hermaphrodite, you would have to possess both, right? And if you didn't possess both, you were pseudo hermaphrodite. Next slide. So this quote is from Alice Drager. Medical men understood as never before the dangers of hermaphroditism and the importance of early and accurate diagnosis of an individual's true sex. Um, this is a great book. Please read it if you can. Next slide. Um, and this was pulled from Anne Foso Sterling. So then what's wild is that on my medical record, on so many people's medical records up until 2006, either it would be people's um, variation or it would be pseudo hermaphrodite. Um, so basically male pseudo hermaphrodite is supposedly being externally male, having female reproductive organs. Um, female pseudo hermaphrodite is sort of like being externally female, having male internal reproductive organs. And true hermaphrodites were what considered like having over testicular, having both, you know, so wild. It's so wild, this classification. Um, again, if you can read Sex in the Body, amazing book. Next slide. Um, so I want to introduce um, J. Marion Sims. People on this call may have heard of J. Marion Sims. 
I can't, I'm so sad that his pitch is not coming up. Maybe it's for the best. Um, Sam, is it possible to, ah, here, here it goes. Okay, Jane, Mary, and Sims. Um, basically, he did some really horrible experiments um, on enslaved Black women in the South, in Alabama. Um, he also continued these experiments on poor Irish women in New York City. He's heralded as a father of modern gynecology in the U.S., um, and I think it's important to sort of locate him in history um, just to show this madness of how men have authority over the bodies of women um, and how, you know, just it's, yeah, we have to hold medicine accountable for its very violent history. Um, next slide, please. Another great book um, is called Medical Bondage by Deidre Cooper Owens. Um, and she says that patients do not leave, archives, doctors do. And, you know, I kind of want to push back on that because I do feel that patients do leave archives. I think it's our responsibility to find those archives. Um, you know, one in intersex circles, um, sort of November 8th is the Day of Remembrance for Herculean Barben um, in France. Um, her sort of memoir was um, sort of translated and found and sort of recreated by Michel Foucault. Um, you know, there are these sort of um, memoirs, these testimonies that exist. I think it's our responsibility to find them because medicine would like to erase those histories. Um, continue, please. Thank you. Next slide. So this is a very interesting one, and this is a very violent slide. And I had reached out to Deidre Cooper Owens because I was like, oh my gosh, do you know that you are finding intersex Black enslaved intersex people in history? What? You know? Um, and I wanted to pull out this piece um, because this really locates Black intersex people in history, right? Um, and so I want to read this because I think it's important, but you know, basically, Deidre Cooper Owens writes, in a discussion of a second case of fused labia, Dr. Archer describes how he treated a young Negro girl who belonged to Mrs. M.A. Archer broke the parturient, that means in labor, girls fused labia with his fingers and doing so allowed her to have a normal delivery despite the painful method employed. That would suggest to me possibly that this patient had probably some variation of CAH, some sort of like androgenital um, variation. Um, and I think it's very powerful to sort of locate this in history and to locate how the savage, very savage beginnings of medicine in the United States. Next slide, please. This is another example. Um, you know, Lizzie, if you're on the call, shout out to you. Um, I thought this was very interesting. So this Anna Thomas, um, Jonathan Neal wanted to prove that true hermaphrodites existed. Um, there was a black intersex woman who was found, um, who was found dead. Um, and I think he positioned her in different ways to sort of show, um, this sort of like, uh, this sort of, uh, sexual dualism, this sexual duality. Um, and he used the, the body of this Black intersex woman to prove that true hermaphrodites existed. Um, and notice he sort of said that she was found among the degraded Blacks um, of the city. Um, next slide, please. I want to give a shout out to John Money um, and Dr. Earhart, who was my um, uh, therapist for a year and a half. Um, at Columbia um, Presbyterian Hospital. Um, Dr. Earhart is still alive. Dr. Earhart is still doing sort of work with CAH, really transphobic, um, <clears throat> still employed at Columbia. Thank you, Coco. Her and Money came together to work on this book, Man, Woman, Boy, Girl. Um, and they established the, the treatment protocols for people with intersex variations have to have to locate them because I think a lot of emphasis is on money but Dr. Earhart is still living and we can hold Dr. Earhart accountable for her actions 
Next slide, please. This is a little bit long. Um, and usually I don't like to put bull blocks of text in the PowerPoint. I don't like doing that. But I wanted to, if you haven't checked it out, please read Jules, Giles, P Jules Gill Peterson, um, her book, Histories of the Transgender Child. She has an excellent sort of like inclusion of intersex people in there. But this quote just shows how there has been a historical obsession with people with CAH. This has been a contested sort of issue for years. This locates a hundred years. The early treatment for people with CAH would be uh, adrenal adrenalectomies, clitorectomies, um, and then when they disco discovered cortisol um, for people who had salt wasting CAH, because a lot of um, children with CAH would die. Um, you know, they thought that they had cured um, sort of like, especially for people who were assigned female at birth, um, that the cortisol would allow them to be straight. It was always sort of like um, a push for people assigned female with CAH to be heterosexual, um, to, you know, aden identify as female. This project has been going on since the 20s, documented right? And probably longer before then. Um, so I just wanted to sort of put that out there that this is contested and this has been contested for a long time. Um, and we have to know that. Next slide, please. Um, again, sort of like what makes this wild with money is that he wanted to test his theory of gender role, gender identity, because he did coin the phrase gender roles and gender identity that we still use today, right? And one of his sort of tests for that was the case of David Reimer. David Reimer, Reimer ended up committing suicide. The story goes is that, um, you know, he's a twin, he was a twin. Both of the twins have committed suicide, unfortunately. Um, his um, small penis was burnt during a circumcision. Um, the parents didn't know what to do. They saw money on TV. They brought Reimer to um, money. Money thought that, you know, Reimer should be raised as a girl because he was just like, you know, sex has nothing to do with gender. Um, and essentially, um, you know, he, I think, you know, David for the first part of his life was raised as female, but then he transitioned to male and that drops out of the medical literature. I included this quote because basically it's weird because on one hand, Dr. Money acknowledges um, that you can't disregard the hurt, but then he was just like, well, in order to cure someone, you have to hurt them. It's so weird. Um, so John Money, may he burn in hell. Next slide. Um, and he also said this in an article in 1987, um, do not forget that in the victimology industry, the sexual abuse doctrine is that children never lie. So again, discounting the experiences of people who have been subject um, to sort of intersex genital mutilation and who register that in their bodies as sexual abuse. Um, and I believe that this is the end of my slides. Um, next slide. Oh yeah, those are my references. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Heck yeah. Thank you, Saifa. I think um, our part about, if I could get a next slide. Yes. Okay. So next up, um, I'm going to lead this section talking folks through some of the practical aspects of intersex language, interacting with patients, considerations, and healthcare needs, because that's something that we really want to equip folks with. Um, Bria's got a couple slides and notes on this section too, so if there's ever anything, Bria, you want to pop in with, like, please also interrupt me. Um, but yeah, next slide, please. I'm really glad that y'all are here today. Um, I use this diagram to illustrate often that if people get any exposure to intersex topics whatsoever, it's very constrained in this medical scientific clinical lens. Next slide. When really, it, you know, things exist at the intersection of so many different lenses and we're providing, you know, this, this bigger zoomed out context. Next slide. So 
human traits exist on a spectrum. Every single human trait has so many different manifestations, you know, height, skin color, eye color, everything. Why would genital anatomy and reproductive anatomy be any different? Um, just because we're sort of have a lot of social baggage around that, especially with the history that Saifa um, mentioned. Next slide. But, you know, there's also a lot of different language surrounding the concepts that we're talking about. So something that I thought would be useful for practitioners is to also break down how some of this language works in a modern context. So intersex is a very contested word. Um, a lot of these words, you know, there's different people who use different words. Um, the folks on this call, a lot of folks in with activism backgrounds tend to use the word intersex because that's a relatively recent term that I consider to be kind of a movement term. Some people use it as an identity term. And it often in U.S. contexts is sometimes viewed through the lens of, you know, LGBT in terms of being an identity or in terms of being, you know, a persecuted group, which has pros and cons. Um, there's definitely a lot of overlap, but there's definitely also a lot of very specific needs that intersex or pe sex diverse people have that are going to be completely different over here. So. If folks have been exposed to any of these concepts, it's quite likely that you've heard of DSD. I don't know, maybe say in the chat, I'm curious to know if that's the way that you were exposed to it in med school curricula, even today. But DSD is disorder of sex development or difference of sex development, which was created in 2006. And that has been a very sticky term. It's a term that a lot of activists um, and intersex affirming folks don't like because it kind of lends itself to the pathology framework, the medical framework, because if something's disordered, then who gets a say in what's done to fix it, right? But the issue with that as well is that there are a lot of people who actually like it. There are a lot of patient groups that doctors group by medical diagnosis term or patient organizations, advocacy organizations that are, you know, people with Kleinfelters, people with CAH that are based around that medical diagnosis term who do prefer to view it that way and who do reject intersex frameworks. So it's a really complicated discussion um, and something that maybe providers wouldn't be exposed to unless they knew some of this community context. Um, I really like what Morgan Holmes, an academic, an intersex academic, said about it. Um, which was that DSD is language that allows parents to keep a safe distance from intersex as a queer identity movement. And I think that's very, very apt um, because it definitely does have those connotations. And so depending on the context that we're in when we talk about these issues, there's definitely a safety piece as well. Um, you know, if there's people from countries or backgrounds um, that have colonial laws and our LGBT people are very persecuted, if you have families that are very conservative, like there's there's a lot of moving pieces to consider with language. Um, in Britain, variations of sex characteristics is very popular. And those of us on those call have taken often to talking about sex diversity, um, regardless of what language people want to use for that, because the point is that we want affirming healthcare and access for people addressing their own needs, no matter what they want to call themselves. Next slide. So yeah, this is the medical framework, right? So often the medical framework starts with chromosomes nowadays and is about putting people into buckets based on what's wrong, based on how the sex and those characteristics deviate. Next slide. I'm not gonna zoom in on that. You'll have the slides. You can look at it later if you want to. What I prefer, as Saifa alluded to, is the Ann Foster Sterling approach of like, look, okay, sex is an umbrella and there's all these things underneath it. So there's these primary sex characteristics of genitalia, gonads, chromosomes, hormones, but there's so many interacting pieces. Could I get a next? So the thing about sex and the thing that medicine, so medicine decides to group people by sex, and that is an assumption that most people will follow one of these two paths completely in order, um, and in a very regular way. And as Saifa mentioned, you know, once medicine entered the scene and it was no longer, you know, women and healers in their own communities, it's like, oh shit, there's all this human variation and medicine is based on statistical norms. So what are we going to do with this? Um, next slide. I often say that intersex people are just very creative at following directions. So when I explain it, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of fuck off and not follow one of these paths. Like maybe you're missing something, maybe you're adding something from the other side, but that is how I kind of give people the idea of regardless of what medical term you use, like that has its place for understanding what people's needs are, but in terms of affirming just diversity of sex characteristics, that's how I like to explain it. Next slide. 
so yeah, that could be chromosomal. There's people who, you know, there's a whole other conversation in genetics testing spaces about, you know, prenatal screening and selective abortion, but there's people who have chromosomes that don't match the genitalia in terms of how we typically think of that or bonus or missing a chromosome. Next slide. It could have to do with the internal tissue. So kind of like Saifa mentioned historically, what's inside. Next slide. It could be hormone production or hormone response. So all bodies make, you know, estrogens and androgens. Everyone has different ratios. But what is the statistical norm, right? Um, that's hotly contested. I don't know. Um, and how does your body respond to, to what you make? Next slide. And just heads up, I always like to tell people if they're not expecting it, there's going to be some drawings of genitalia because I think as providers, it's important to, to know concretely, you know, what you might be looking at and how to talk about it in a more affirming way. Next slide. This is what's called the Quigley scale. And like Saifa alluded to historically, um, all of these traits exist on a spectrum. So every person has erectile tissue and whether that's large and outside as a penis or smaller and inside as a clitoris, everyone has that. Same thing with scrotolabium. Same thing with whether or not you have an opening to the internal anatomy in the body. So that's sort of the scrotum slash opening spectrum. And so as you can see, and as we saw in those historical examples, people are gonna fall at all kinds of different points. Most people fall to you know the extremes of the bell curve, but of course with these intersex variations, they fall at midpoints on the spectrum. Next slide. And I hope this video loads because I really love it. But if it doesn't, you can always type it in or maybe if you click on it, it'll play. I don't know how the PowerPoint integration works. Um, but yeah, you can see the anatomical similarities that a clit is just really like a secret penis. And a lot of the nerves and a lot of the structure is very similar. Um, this video that I wish would load is this really beautiful animation that someone made of like a clit reproductive system transforming into a penis reproductive system and back and forth and back and forth and the parts just slide and alternate and it's really great. Um, so if people want to look at that later, fantastic. Um, but next slide, I feel like that captures the point. <laughs> um, and yeah, as we mentioned, there's so much diversity even in people who are not intersex and not trans that it's kind of ambiguous where the line even is drawn. This is a popular education account called the Vulva Gallery. And you can even see like, you know, again, just across the board, it's like, where do you draw the line? Something that I always like to say is like, when is someone tall? I don't know. But, you know, medicine is really based on statistical norms. So as we've talked about, and as with those historical legacies, it's very oriented around putting people into those statistical norms. Next slide. And so this is where I'm explaining a little bit of the context of some of that different language. So there's the medical terms for packages of traits and packages of things that can go wrong, um, which is this column to the left. Um, some of the medical names of what we consider intersex variations or not, depending on you know, who gets to draw that line and where that line is drawn. But what intersex activists and what folks who come at it from more of a movement lens are talking about is more of these shared experiences um, that regardless of the medical language, medical language can have its place in helping people understand what their needs are. But we're really talking about sort of a pan diagnostic movement for affirming healthcare access. Next slide. And as Saifa pointed out in the history, again, who gets to draw that line? There's a lot of contemporary examples of how that history picks right up, like we see in terms of things like sports sex testing, where athletes competing in a female category are subjected to all kinds of degrading practices. And it's often, you know, athletes of color um, who are subject to these sort of white supremacist norms of opposite sex of, again, that's the legacy kind of like what Saifa mentioned is that this concept of opposite sexes was based on the idea that white people were superior because there was the greatest amount of difference between white men and white women. And so we see the legacy of this in things like the sports testing, where who is it that's getting their gender questioned? Who is it that's being brought in for these humiliating testing practices? Um, well, you know, we see this. We see the white women competitors and then the competitors as pictured who are subjected to these practices. And again, noting language because people have different reasons for the language that they use. And I not athletes don't always use the term intersex, especially if it's connected to being um, a queer identity movement because their interest is in competing as women. So that totally makes sense, right? Intersex shouldn't, intersex people shouldn't have to defend their gender, but I understand people's reasons for different language choices. Next slide. 
And can I add oh, sorry, to, yeah. to that, uh, Hans? Uh, could we go back? Thank you. And, you know, we know that there's been a history uh, with Black women's bodies being perceived as too masculine. But what I wanted to add, add here is that uh, Sam Sharp, who I believe is in the audience, um, wrote, wrote this really wonderful article that I'm going to pop in the chat uh, on the exclusion of trans and intersex people in sports. And, you know, in society, we, we have this really jaded perception about you know, what it looks like and what it means to be a woman. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, just wanting to call out how uh, racist and anti-Black our, you know, um, just the way we operate in society is. And let me add that link to the chat now. Thank you. Sorry, Hans. That's a great point. Next slide. Um, this is another modern example of that legacy that Saifa was talking about. Anti-trans healthcare legislation. Something that's really tough for me to see in the news is that it always misses the intersex piece. Every single one of these bills is never going to use the word trans or intersex, but they will have codified exemptions to people with verifiable genetic disorders, allowing the most invasive medical procedures, medical interventions in the interest of this sort of gender normalcy. So um, the trans bills are subjecting intersex people explicitly to the things that they think trans children are accessing. The quote on the right is a tweet from an ACLU comms person that I'm not going to read out loud, but y'all have it. Next slide. And yeah, so again, I think it's important to mention in these advocacy conversations that we're categorically talking about a certain type of intervention. It's not anything that's related to saving a life. These are things that are not life-saving. They're connected to assumptions about body and gender based on these legacies. They're not functionally necessary for infants. And the biggest issue is that the risks and long-term considerations are not fully explained to the adults who will have to bear the lifelong consequences of those decisions. So we're talking about things like clitoral reduction, repositioning, whatever euphemisms they're using. Casey is so on this, has like this beautiful spreadsheet of all the studies and everything can talk about that. Um, things like urogenital sinus um, for folks with CAH are often, you know, very misleading. And things like hypospadias repair, which is centered often around aesthetics and peeing standing up, but it's a very risky surgery anytime you're doing something in that dense of an area with nerves and the urethra. Um, again, things like that, things with vaginal depth and presence. So that is what we are talking about. These are things that are not necessary for infants that need to be involving the individual who's going to live with them for the course of their life. Next slide. Bria? Yeah, and so oftentimes uh, with uh, with the surgeries, doctors and parents are, are really making these big assumptions about what type of body, you know, a child might want or choose to have when they get older, right? And so there's also, you know, this assumption being made that all intersex children will identify as cisgendered when they get older as well. But not just assumptions about their gender, there's also big assumptions being made about uh, their eventual sexuality as well. One thing that doctors often say to intersex children, I know it was said to me, um, and they say it to their parents, is that, you know, surgery is necessary uh, in order for us to have sex with our husbands one day. Because heteronormative sexual function and engagement is is what's prioritized in our society. And so if you were either born without a vaginal canal, for example, or if you were born with a vaginal canal, that's, that's not large enough to accommodate a penis. Well, then we need to cor uh, correct that surgically. Intersex issues are, are seen as medical issues that need to be fixed through, uh, you know, surgery. And so there is no holistic care available for us, even as intersex adults. We were made to believe that these multidisciplinary teams are supposed to, you know, fix these problems. But the issue is that, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, who's on a child's medical care team if that child's too young to participate in the conversation in a way that's meaningful. And one thing, you know, doctors like to make us believe is that surgery is just going to solve all of our problems, right? A lot of parents are concerned about their, their kids being bullied for having genital differences. But surgery doesn't prevent bullying. I know that firsthand. 
no one knew what my genitals looked like. And I was still bullied for having other, you know, the other intersex traits that I have. And there's absolutely no patient centered outcomes uh, for these surgeries, at least not that I could find. And, you know, a quote unquote successful surgery is really based on, you know, what the surgeon's idea of what success is. And no one has followed up with me personally now that I'm an adult to ask about how, you know, I felt about the surgery, about the outcomes of surgery now that some time has passed. Intersex patients need to be involved in designing those outcome measures as well, because what success looks like to me might look different than what success looks like for, for my doctor, for example. So uh, sure, I now have a vaginal canal large enough to accommodate a penis. I had surgery as a child, but I also have scar tissue. And I had to have a follow-up procedure six years later after the original procedure to have that scar tissue removed. These are risks that uh, are not disclosed to us or to our parents. None of my doctors are following up with me, asking me questions about things like sexual satisfaction. Uh, I shouldn't have to sign up for a research study to be asked these questions. Uh, the thing is, you know, the risk for performing even one irreversible gender genital normalizing surgery and getting it wrong, the risk for that is too high. It's not enough to say things like, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, but that wasn't my experience because I'm happy with my outcome. And it's not enough to say, oh, well, my other patients were happy with their outcomes, right? And we know that these irreversible surgeries are still happening on children today. So it's not enough to say things like, oh, well, the technology has gotten so much better because these, <laughs> these surgeries are deemed a form of torture from so many international human rights organizations. It doesn't matter if the technology has gotten better. People deserve the right to bodily autonomy and integrity. And, you know, the trauma that comes from these repeated and unnecessary genital examinations have caused PTSD for so many of us. And many of us uh, receive care at teaching hospitals. And I know that for me, I didn't know that I had the option to say no to these uncomfortable examinations where the residents lined up and, you know, paraded around to look at our bodies. I mean, that, that's really in, inhumane. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, I wanna talk a little bit more about this idea of womanhood for, for a second and what it means to be a woman in uh, this society because a lot of the issues we're seeing here have to do with the patriarchal policing of women's bodies, right? And so I have congenital adrenal hyperplasia or CAH and I'll share a link in the chat uh, to a talk that uh, we did last year, uh, it was actually in person at Mount Sinai, where I, I shared more about my own personal story. And we, you know, Casey really got into the weeds about what CAH is, um, because CAH is one of the more common intersex variations that actually leads to genital surgery. And so I really recommend that folks check that, that recording out. But so I have XX chromosomes, I have typical internal female reproductive organs, but naturally my body produces higher levels of testosterone. And because of that, I developed uh, secondary male characteristics. I had a puberty that was both masculinizing and feminizing. I was developing breasts and menstruating while I was also developing facial and body hair. Uh, and unfortunately, something that I hear often, especially from within the CAH community is that children with CAH, um, especially the young girls with CAH are not intersex because according to their parents, they are quote unquote real girls. Because in our society, womanhood is still tied to a person's ability to engage in heteronormative sex and have babies. And so this image uh, is, is one that I saw in a presentation by Dr. Uh, Critch uh, sex, sex testing in the uh, Olympics. And, you know, the problem with this image is that, you know, I don't look like this. The majority of us don't look like this. It's completely unrealistic. And as someone who has CAH and was socialized 
as a woman for at least part of my life, I, every time I look at this, I know it reaffirms that I am on the complete opposite end of this spectrum, which means that I am undesirable, I am unattractive, I am less feminine, and there's no way that I could be a woman, right? And we know that, you know, this is based on Western beauty standards that we all know celebrate whiteness and the standard is to be thin, to be youthful, have white skin, have fine hair. Um, and we know that it's classes and I, you know, people pay a lot of money to look like they do, to look like the Kardashians or whatever the beauty standard is today. And unfortunately, it doesn't I will try to, I probably won't read all of this because I want to make sure we have time for, for what else is on the agenda. Um, but I wanted to speak a little bit about, after everything that Bria said about this mismatch between like sort of assumptions and what those outcomes have been based on, eight or six people or whatever language we use have very real healthcare needs. Um, everybody needs therapy, emotional support, fertility support if applicable, um, things like lifelong hormone therapy access, um, adrenal condition management, but especially also healing from unwanted interventions. And something that I'll note is that if people are giving you studies about childhood surgeries, ask who they are talking to, because pediatric urologists, pediatric endocrinologists, the people who perform these interventions are very different than the people who are seeing the adults affected by them. There is not a lot of lifelong follow-up. So one of the examples that I always love to talk about is my uncle who's a pelvic floor therapist at a veterans hospital who sees trans and intersex clients. And you know, there's a lot of stories I could say about that, but those are the types of people who I wish we would be talking to in terms of collecting data, which is what everyone goes off of, to gauge the success of these practices. Next slide. And again, um, I'll try to go through this quick, um, but opportunities as clinicians, you know, to use affirming language, naming parts simply for what they are instead of assuming male, female gendering, um, and having that sensitivity with the lens that we provided today in disclosure, and of course, centering the patient's desired outcomes, um, which we can't do if we make choices when someone is an infant, because it's perfectly valid for someone to want to have penetrative sex, to care about fertility, to have to care about those milestones, but the point that we're trying to make is that people should be able to opt into that and also have the opportunity to keep their body as they were born if they choose. Um, organ inventories is another tool um, in helping to understand what someone has versus what they don't instead of assuming um, based on what someone looks like. Next slide. I'm gonna skip that because we don't have time. Next slide. Um, yeah, I'm gonna roll it off to Casey for talking about med student organizing. And we had some breakout rooms planned. We'll see how we're doing for time. Okay, we're going to go really fast through this. I just wanna give y'all a sneak peek of like what things we can do as med students so you know what breakout rooms to go into. So there's kind of like these six large buckets that I identified. So medical education, extracurricular education, which is what we're doing right now with this talk at Mount Sinai with the Columbia med students as well. Uh, direct action, legislation, research, and then grants next. All right, so for example, um, this was the endocrine curriculum um, at HMS. They actually did use disorders of sex development. I sent them um, a very long <laughs> list of edits and they 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 took um, a few after telling me they would take all of them, which was disappointing and weird, um, but they did end up changing disorders of sex development to differences in sex development and a few other changes that I felt were very necessary um, to, be, to be addressing folks, um, but lots of work still to be done at Harvard Med. Next. Um, we also um, got a LGBTQI plus curriculum in the OBGYN um, clerkship education, and we did include intersex folks in that. I just encourage people that are working with an LGBTQI plus student groups to always include intersex people. I'm always available. The Columbia students are available. We're really excited about medical education. So if you really want to include intersex folks, you only have a few minutes because of requirements, please like get in contact with us because it's always worthwhile mentioning intersex folks. Um, next. 
Um, this was another extracurricular education effort that we, we hosted an LGBTQIA plus conference. We ended up getting some funding to fly people out and house them for this conference. So this was a great way to get conversations going at Harvard. Next. Um, you can do a film screening. So this is an intersex and faith film screening event that we had. It was a really great way to bring different student groups together. So students from the faith based organizations, as well as LGBTQI plus organizations kind of came together and had this conversation about the sanctity of like body, um, the body you're born with. And there are actually a lot of like um, bridging there. And uh, people really actually enjoyed the event, especially folks with LGBTQI plus identities who really felt that they weren't in touch with that kind of spiritual divinity aspect of their life. So it was a very nice event. They're still taking requests from schools to do screenings again feel free to reach out next <laughs> Um, and just to say extracurricular education actually does matter. I know that like formal med ed is always like the sexy pie in the sky, but like the stuff that we do in these casual spaces and in an extra extracurricular settings really does change the tone at institutions, gets conversations going and is really important. So, you know, I, I have said no to a lunch talk because I've been like annoyed at what I've been offered. So it's okay to say no if you're burnt out, but it is worth doing at your institution. So just get it, get the, get the conversation going is it's really important. Next. Okay, so then kind of we have that was like medical education and now we sort of have direct action. So this was a human rights rally that we had in front of and protest that we had in front of um, Wheel Cornell. Next, um, at this protest, we, uh, next Sam, uh, at this protest, we specifically, I'm not seeing it. Thank you. Um, so at this protest, we specifically protested Dr. Dix Pappas, who does a lot of the really harmful clitoral reduction surgeries in young children, who has faced a lot of human rights backlash um, because of vibrational stimulation testing performed on his patients. Um, we don't do that. That's very bad. And this is actually being replicated in India. Um, it was replicated this past year in India in 2022. So um, unless he loses his job, his experiments and clinical practice will keep going. So um, yeah, so we're building political alliances in New York to, to try to get... Um, the New York Presbyterian hospital system, which includes Columbia and Cornell to hold them accountable for, for their continued harms of the community. Next. And I just wanna say that this has really, um, like the work that SIFE has done um, has really paved the way um, for the, the, the movement that's happening in New York right now specifically and just overall nationally. Um, and, and SIFE's direct action is really part and parcel of the Lurie Children's decision to end um, unnecessary intersex surgeries. There is a lot of drama still going on there as far as like where CAH lands, which we cannot cover now, but it just direct action can do what medical activism does in like three years and one day. And it's just really important to recognize that. Now, Next. All right, so you could also get a part of legislation. Um, next, Sam. So this was a protective Rhode Island bill for intersex youth. I'm not going to get too into it now. Next. Um, but it's we, we read a petition. We ended up getting it signed by like 700 healthcare workers and medical students. Um, next. And, you know, there's just like various ways that you can get people to participate. Um, I like made these templates so people could like call in and send in letters so that the, you know, there's not very many people in Rhode Island who so are like really hitting them up a lot. So like they knew. <laughs> um, next. And this is just an example of, you know, different um, alumni from Brown University kind of like signing up for different representatives. So just ways to kind of divvy up labor within legislation. I can talk with you about that if that's of interest. Next. <laughs> This is a talk we gave with Senator Tiara Mack, who's on this call right now, who's been such an advocate for intersex justice. But if you're interested in doing legislation at your local state level to protect intersex folks, definitely something we're interested in supporting. Uh, next. There's also research. So it's really important to do inter intersex led and intersex centered research. So this is very briefly, this is intersex. Uh, this is work that I did looking at the neurological risks of these so-called nerve sparing surgeries um, done by uh, Dr. Dix Pappas and pediatric urologists. Too long, didn't read, they are not nerve sparing. Next. And then, yeah, uh, intersex led research efforts are being done by Courtney Skaggs, looking at the needs of people in between um, pediatric and um, uh, adult care. And so really putting intersex people like as leaders of their own research is so important and then just like trying to support where it makes sense as a medical student. Next. Um, and then, yeah, trying to apply for grants. So I'm happy to talk about this all day, but med students have access to money. I have applied for grants for work with intersex folks. I've applied to grants for work with folks in trans folks in Peru. Like there are ways, there is money, and we have access to institutions. We have access to mentors. And so recently we applied to a Massachusetts Medical Society grant. 
to help compensate the intersex participants in our studies. You should never, ever, ever be doing research with people unless you have some sort of plan to compensate them. Obviously, like if you're serving med students, like they're fine, but like, you know, it's nice to throw in a little bit, but for, for, for patient populations who have experienced the degree of medical trauma, such as intersex people, always, always compensate. I am so happy to talk with you about what different grants are available to med students, but I know we have like a narrative, like poor med students, like, yes, like we do need funds. And also we do have access to institutional power and money. Um, so yeah, and I believe that's it. So breakout rooms, uh, maybe these last 10 minutes, um, we can just kind of talk about how we get organized among ourselves. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah. 